or Ember or Cordover specifically. Uh, we did not build Ember. I would never take claim to that. So, hey everybody, as you said, Alex, uh, incredibly jet lagged, so we're going to have to keep walking around just to stay awake uh, right now, but that's how it worked out. Today we're going to talk about browser internals for JS devs. And it's really just a smattering of information, I'll go to the agenda in a second, in terms of both things we find we're having to teach most of our clients all the time, and just stuff that's really useful to know the deeper you get into, especially framework or JS framework driven applications. I'm going to skip that because we've already spoken about it. Uh, we didn't build Ember, we didn't build Cordova, just to call that explicitly, we maintain Ember Cordova, which is bindings between the two of them. And that's really when I started thinking about this talk. Um, usually when I talk, it's about how to build hybrid apps, hybrid performance, you know, how we handle reflows and stuff like that. And every time we get into this, it comes down to, well, you know, what is our browser doing? How is it passing things? And how do we make it work quickly? So first, we should just quickly quantify what a browser's job is. And for the purpose of today, it's to get and present a selected resource, which in our case is HTML, right? It could also be trying to get PDF. It could be trying to render an XML document or something like that. Every comment I make today is specific to HTML rendering. So for those who aren't familiar, uh, Chrome and Safari do use slightly different engines under the hood, and we're going to get into specifics of each of them just a little bit. Uh, so Chrome's JavaScript engine is called V8, which you'll you know, often hear framework developers either love or complain about all the time. Uh, I'm going to get into why as well. And the rendering engine is called Blink. Uh, Safari uses Nitro and WebKit. Uh, explicitly, WebCore there would be the you know, rendering engine. Uh, WebKit is a combination of a rendering engine and basically a JavaScript piece as well. So I didn't make this graph, just like anybody who hacks on open source all day. If there's somebody who's done a better job, I'm just going to take their work and credit them down the bottom. Uh, this is a really nice graph just explaining the process that a browser goes through, all the main components. So we have our user interface. And one of the interesting things they actually make in this article, I put sources at the end, and I'd highly suggest you read this if you're interested, is that the user interface, while it's generally standardized among browsers, isn't actually a standard by any respect. Right? There's no standard for a, hey, that's a little snitch. Let's just kill that. There's no standard for a back button. There's no standard for a you know, bookmark section. There's no real even standard for an address bar. This is just something that every vendor has gone and implemented generally the same. We have our rendering engine, which we're going to get deep into today. Again, we've pointed out the differences between the two main browsers there. And the browser engine, which is really responsible for marshalling actions in between those two objects. Then we obviously you know, go down, we have our networking layer, which would be responsible for making our HTTP requests, our JavaScript interpreter, UI background, and then obviously data persistence, which might be something like local storage or some you know, browser-based database that we're using. As well, commonly in browsers, you're going to find that there are two main threads responsible for doing the work. And when we get talking about jank and reflow, you know, hopefully knowing this will make it a little bit easier to understand. We have what's commonly called our main thread, which is responsible for just running JavaScript, you know, handling our styles, you know, passing CSS, layout, and painting. And I'm going to explain what painting is as well. And then we have our compositor thread, which is generally responsible for drawing bitmaps by the GPU. So for those who aren't familiar, this is generally how things get rendered on your screen. And it's also responsible for handling things like scroll events, as well as what's about to be visible in a scroll, and should I start pre-painting that? So as the user's flying across the screen up and down, we're not constantly pausing to render the next bits of information. So again, another great image that I just couldn't be bothered to replicate, so may as well credit the guy who made it. But what's interesting here is it basically goes through, and we're going to talk about most of these steps individually, the process that a browser goes through for rendering our documents and running our JavaScript. So you know, we start with a document, in our case HTML, and then we pass it, and I'll show you what that parsing looks like. We start with a content or a, and then a DOM tree, which I'm also going to get into. Then obviously we you know, construct that into a rendering tree and paint, right? which is actually putting something onto the screen. And then we have you know, our DOM APIs and whatever else it is that we're dealing with. So for those who aren't familiar, the DOM tree has one tag per item, but it doesn't actually really hold any content. 
So we wouldn't see stuff like text in a DOM tree as much as we'd see that there is a text node, right? But we're not actually going to have content in there. It always starts with you know, a document or something like that as the root. And you'll see in this DOM tree example, which would be you know, a basic HTML document, it has a head tag, a title tag, a body tag, a P tag. And instead of having the text that would have been inside the paragraph, we just know that there's a text node there. Right? So we're basically describing what nodes are showing up in the tree so that when we actually get to painting, we know what to do. Uh, what's interesting is in WebKit, if you're just interested under the hood, uh, the root node is actually just called node.h, right? It's a C header file that we're talking about there. And note that these are documents, elements, and text. There's not a lot else that's going on inside of a DOM tree. Then we have our render tree, which is slightly different. So the render tree is basically that visual part of the DOM where we actually start to include content and stuff like that. So the root element is basically the container for everything else. So you know, that is why we have root at the top. We have our body, and obviously body lives inside of root because we have things like head as well. Body is never the complete root of a document. And we have divs and lines. Um, so it may contain, I wrote elms here, I obviously meant lms but uh, that don't have any DOM information. So if you're interested as well, just the web core representations of these under the hood. Uh, again, some sources will be at the end if you want to read into these classes. We can only touch so much today. Is our render flow, render block, and render inline. So if you've worked with CSS much before, you can probably start telling how your styles are starting to affect the classes that are being affected under the hood to render your document. So one interesting thing to note before we actually go into how the parsing works is that parsing HTML is actually a really difficult task. Um, and the reason is that it allows completely invalid stuff and it's going to keep rendering. So if you're not familiar, HTML and XML are actually from the same family, but developers hate working with XML, but we, I don't wanna say we love HTML, but we're able to write it and we tolerate it and deal with it. And one of the reasons is if you make a mistake in XML, it's just going to completely shit the bed and ask what you just did. Um, whereas HTML would just fly along and be happy. So with some examples here, you know, we can miss closing a body tag and the document's still going to render, which is something we couldn't do in a lot of other cases. You know, another really good example is I could open up a div, open up a paragraph, close the div, and then close the paragraph. In any other context, that would just completely crap out in the browser or you know, a standard parser wouldn't know what to do but the HTML parsers that are inside of our browsers just continue to recover us from these scenarios and make things work. And this is why parsing HTML is such a difficult task to do and why sometimes going to the internals is a crazy endeavor. If you actually go into the WebKit source code, you'll find some poor developers actually started documenting all of the edge cases they've had to account for. And the real reason is that you know, when they started writing these engines, you know, people didn't really know how to write HTML yet. Obviously, the HTML spec has changed. They didn't want the web to completely break. So there's all of these accommodating cases that you wouldn't see in a lot of other places. Uh, one of the other reasons as well is, you know, you'll see in HTML a lot of times that people are inventing tag names all the time and just creating completely new tags. So there kind of needs to be some accommodation for that, whether you think that's a good thing or not. So another thing that's important to notice in the context of how your browser is running is that execution actually stops at every single script tag, and it's going to stop rendering until it's finished loading that script in. So this is why you see a common piece of advice to actually move your script tags to the end of your body document. Um, so this is also why you know, sometimes you'll see somebody who's less experienced might put analytics in their header or at the start of their body or they might even put you know, all of their actual JavaScript frameworks in the header, it's actually much better to render some arbitrary type of HTML content and then load the rest of the JavaScript in. You know, we know users bounce the longer we make them wait, so even if it doesn't look good yet or we can't track them just yet, let's show them something and then load in the rest of our JavaScript. If you're using HTML5, though, you can actually add that async tag into your scripts and what that will do is actually have the browser load the JavaScript in a completely separate thread. Um, so that will save you from some cases. Even if you're doing that, it is still a best practice to keep that at the bottom of the body just in case something goes wrong, in case you know, you're dealing with a password that's not following HTML5 spec. And frankly, just it makes more sense to put them at body once you've been doing it for a long time. 
So I spoke about layout briefly before, so I want to go a little bit deeper into that as well. So what's interesting is that layout information is often cached inside of the browser. So once that tree has been generated once, and we go through a reflow event, and I'm going to cover reflow in a lot more depth, it's not like it has to go and recompute what was my state before we recompute the next state. It's actually keeping all of that in memory. The reason this matters is I'm going to go into the Chrome Profiler as well, and obviously the more stuff we're putting in memory, the larger our app footprint is becoming. So I'm not going to read through this list just in the interest of time, but the main things here are that you know, the parent renderer will determine its own width, then go through its children, and then go through its child layout process. So generally speaking, a node will always worry about itself before its children, and then it will have some type of you know, container that it needs to worry about. And this is perhaps a better explanation of that is as we're actually painting on the screen. Uh, these are the, basically the order of operations that your browser is going to go through rendering. So the first thing it's going to attack is actually background colors. That's why sometimes if you have an image on a node that has a background color, you'll see the background color flash for a fraction of a second or something like that. The next thing it's going to paint is the background image. Then it will paint its border, children, and outline. So you know, where this really matters is if you're rendering something that's, say, a gigantic long list or something like that, we can start to make sure that our text content or what we want somebody to see ahead of time will actually be rendered. Nine times out of 10, you don't need to worry about this stuff, but this talk is internals, right? So you shouldn't need to worry about most of this most of the time. It's just good and fun to know. So I referenced tokenization as well in that early graph. So if you're not familiar, this is just generally what a tokenization process would look like as the browser's going through trying to read what is our node. So if I had just an italic tag that had web view, it would open a start tag of i, then it would have four car tags, one for W, E, B, and U, and car tag is the correct name. And then it would have an end tag of I. And that's how we'd actually go through the process of tokenizing that italic web U and passing that information further up and down the stack. Another quick little thing I always point out, please don't rewrite any JavaScript because I say this, because I still use for loops all the time as well. Uh, but it's an interesting little thing to know about is that you know, this for loop up the top where we're doing you know, var i equals zero, i is less than 10,000 plus plus, will actually run slower than the while loop that's run below it. Um, and, and we're not talking about anything that's noticeable. Most of the time, even though I know this, I will still write a for loop as well. Um, but it's always faster, especially when we're going through that decrementing while loop. Another thing you want to know about your browser is that set timeout is actually not guaranteed to be accurate, and frankly, it's not most of the time. It's actually a best effort. So if you're running a timeout every, say, three seconds or 30 seconds, depending on what else is going on in your call stack, that might take 32 seconds, that might even take 37 seconds. So sometimes we see users who go through and, say, have a set timeout every 30 seconds because they're running a clock or a timer or something like that, and they wonder why their time's getting out of sync immediately. So just be aware that set timeout isn't guaranteed to do anything. It's just going to put itself in the call stack when it thinks it's best and hope that everything else is going quickly. So jumping into reflows, which is when we start to tie a lot of this stuff together, who here actually knows what reflow is? OK, only a couple. So reflow is one of the more expensive things that your browser is going to do. Um, when you work on hybrid, this becomes really important. And it's basically your browser has to go through and geometrically recompute what's on the page, where is it, what color is it, is this visible? Um, this happens you know, when we resize the window or something like that. And this is typically where jank comes from, right? We're animating something across the screen that starts to get choppy. It's because the browser's in a reflow event right now, or most probably. So what causes reflow? You know, resizing the browser window will because we're actually changing the size of our frame. And the important thing to know here is that reflow doesn't just reflow on the one element that we potentially changed, because obviously our CSS is getting quite interdependent. So it has to walk up and down the tree to figure out, well, what exactly am I changing here? You know, using any JavaScript methods that involve computed styles, obviously if we add or remove elements from the DOM, that's going to cause a reflow because we've just you know, ripped something outside. And changing an element's classes is obviously going to reflow because we've just changed a class and it's wondering what to do.
Uh, if you're interested a little bit more in Reflow, Google actually have a really good uh, article. I'll put these slides online, but that link is worth having a look at, just in terms of all of the different causes of Reflow and how we typically avoid it. Some quick tips, though. One of them is visibility hidden. So we know that removing an element from the DOM is going to cause a Reflow event, and we know we're going to make a bunch of DOM changes later. So we just want to push our expensive Reflow out as far as possible into the future. So because we know that, what a naive developer or somebody who's just trying and doesn't know will do is then set display none on the element. But that's changing a CSS class, and we've caused the same problem we had before. Uh, for those who don't know, visibility hidden actually won't cause a reflow event. So if you need to temporarily hide an element or just kind of push it away, set visibility hidden, and you've actually done that without causing a reflow event. Another example here is uh, CSS transforms only affect the selected element and not those around it. So if you're not familiar, a CSS transform is like your translate X, translate Y, and your transitions within CSS. And they're what we call our hardware accelerated functions. And I'm going to show you some examples, but coming back to those two threads we discussed, it's because they're mostly happening on the compositor thread, not on the main thread. And that leaves our main thread open to keep doing whatever else we want our app to be doing. Uh, is that rendering big enough for everybody, or should I blow it up? We'll go through it verbally. Um, so this was actually generated by Adobe. Again, I was going to create all of these examples, and people have just done way better than I did. But imagine that uh, what's going on here is we have a div that's 100 pixels high, and we're going to animate it to be 200 pixels high, and they've done it with an absolute animation, right? So we're basically jQuery.animate, you know, height 101, 102, 103 pixels. So what's going on in this top left orange box is that we have to lay out the element for the first time, right? A browser has to do that anyway. Then it has to paint that element into a bitmap. By the way, this on the left is the main thread, and on the right is the compositor thread, if you can't make out the text. Next thing is we go to the compositor thread, and it has to upload the bitmap into GPU memory, and then you know, draw that bitmap onto a user's screen. Then we shift back to our main thread, because we're starting an animation, and it starts a CSS transition from you know, height 100 to height 200. So the first thing it does is it sets height to 101 pixels. Then it has to relay out the element, repaint the element into a bitmap, upload that again to GPU memory, draw that bitmap onto the screen, and then we just rinse and repeat, right? Set height to 102, relay out the element, repaint, and back and forth. And that's typically where you'll see jank come from and why we don't like our you know, absolute animations or anything like that. Um, I'm actually running on time right now, but I was planning on just saying 100, 100, 200, 100, 405 if I was running early, just to catch up on time. So this is what our hardware accelerator, or a translate X, or a translate Y animation would look like in comparison. So the start is exactly the same, right? At our main thread, we lay out the element for the first time, and then we paint the element into a bitmap. Then we go to the compositor thread and do the same thing to start with. We upload the bitmap into GPU memory, draw it onto the screen, go back to our main thread and start a CSS transition. In this case, they've just described it as a scale. Then you'll see that everything from there on out is happening on the compositor thread. So if you weren't familiar, this is actually why these animations run so much faster and so much smoother. So given we have time, I'm actually going to pop open Xcode and show you a quick demo of the difference here, because what I have is an app that will output how many frames per second we're running at. So I actually wrote this for the uh, talk that I was doing in Zurich that we just got back from. And apologies, I should have opened Xcode before we started talking. I was going to make a joke as well that, by the way, I use BIM. I don't know whether that's a running joke here as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right, is that big enough for everybody to read? Great. So this is a terrible animation, but I want to show you the worst one first. And what we're doing here is we have actions, we have an animate. Don't worry about this. This is just Ember code. But then we have this dot box, right? I'm just using a jQuery accessor dot animate top to 800 pixels at a time of 15 seconds. The next thing we have is better animation component where you'll see I'm doing the exact same thing to the same element. I just copy-pasted the component and called it different names so it was easier to demo. We we're using a CSS transform instead, translate Y at 15 seconds. So what I'm going to do is quickly put both of these in here so that I 
don't have to build the app twice. I'm just going to quickly build this so that you can see how it runs on a phone, because that's typically the worst environment for something like this to run in. If you're not familiar with what that little pop-up is, by the way, I actually run an outbound firewall on my Mac, and I'm still too paranoid to disable it when I'm doing talks, but the most annoying thing is it keeps popping up as I'm trying to speak. Right, so we've just done an Xcode build. I'm going to pop this into an iPad simulator so you can all see it. Ignore the app. This was for a Cordova demo that I did, and it's just easy to recycle it. It's not supposed to be pretty. That's my wonderful splash screen. So down here, I've installed a DOM stats plugin. So it's just going to show us how fast things are running at. So I'm going to do that first animation, which is this top box. And we'll see that's going incredibly choppy. And we're dropping you know, way down you know, 40 frames per second, potentially lower than that. We typically want to be getting as close to 60 as we can, because that's when a user will see that as being smooth. Let's obviously stop now, because I told it to only animate for 800 pixels. Now, because I didn't get time, I didn't actually write that stop animate button that you saw, so I just need to quickly rebuild the app. And what we're going to do now is run the same animation, but hardware accelerated. And you'll see this isn't really ever going to drop below 55. In fact, it's probably going to hang around 60 the whole time. So as a user, we might want to you know, change the speed of this animation so that it looks a little bit nicer. But hopefully what you just saw is we went from you know, dropping down to 45 frames per second to not dropping below 58 frames per second for the whole animation there. So just really quickly, if we want to avoid reflow, some best practices, again, taken from uh, this is actually taken from a PhoneGap blog. Links are down the bottom. I'm not going to read all of these out, but the main things are to batch our DOM changes. Um, so this might be either, it sounds terrible, but writing a long string that coalesces multiple CSS changes at once. Another common technique is if we know we're about to do a lot of work, actually replicate that node into local JavaScript, make all of the changes we need to on this thing that's not living inside of the DOM, rip out the old element, and put the new one in. Because now we've only caused maybe two reflow events instead of one reflow event per change that we're trying to make. And obviously, just I, I like how you know, the last point they have is avoid unnecessary complex things. As a developer, that's always a good idea. Don't try and outsmart yourself. It never works. So that's what I was just saying there. Coalesce changes or work on a local fragment. This is my solution nine times out of 10. So another option that we have here are animation frames. This is in Chrome. This is in Safari. You can use it on hybrid apps. Uh, just quick show of hands, who here knows what animation frames are? OK, so again, only a couple. So what animation frames let us do is basically say to the browser, it was originally proposed by, I, I believe it was Paul Arish, but don't hold me to that, um, that you know, we can tell the browser that, hey, I'm about to do all of these different things. I'm about to do you know, four different animations or five different animations. Can I tell you, and you will handle batching all of this for me? So historically, what we might have done is write an animate function, which is a developer we've batched items together. But the browser is not aware that we're trying to get a bunch of things done. So this is what an animation frame is for, right? We go and sequence a lot of work, request an animation frame, and then the browser will handle batching that. The other nice thing about an animation frame is it actually won't run as if the tab is inactive. So we're not going to chew through a user's battery running completely unnecessary animations. Uh, the thing with them is that they have a 15 millisecond target. It's actually like 16.66 or something like that, which is how long each animation frame runs, right? Basically a tick inside the browser each time. So taking longer than that is actually going to cause more reverse effects than never using this before. So you need to be incredibly explicit with your timing. And that 15 milliseconds actually includes all of the work the browser has to do as well. So mentally, I'm usually thinking that I have about a 10 millisecond budget per animation frame that I'm running and try and fit all of the work I need to do into that. I'm going to show you how we profile this in Chrome tools as well to see how long our animations are running for. But just to quickly show you first what an animation frame would look like, I've just basically ripped outside of an Ember component that translate. But you'll see we basically wrote an animation function here. 
I've arbitrarily put steps just so I have a reason to keep calling this thing over and over again. Then right down the bottom, we do window.request animation frame and we pass it a function. That function will run in a single animation frame and at the very end, I'm basically just looping over and over and over and over again. So measuring performance. So I typically do my profiling in Chrome tools even though I use Safari as my main browser. And you know, we have a couple of different profilers going on. We have our CPU profiler, I'm gonna show you all of these, which is you know, what's taking the longest to run. We have our timeline, which is, you know, is something taking too long to render? Is something janking up or not looking as we'd like it to? We have timers, which is our standard JavaScript timers, and we're just trying to figure out, you know, how long did my JavaScript itself take to execute inside of this single block? And we have our heap profile, which is, you know, how much memory is my app taking? which is very important for hybrid. I'm gonna get into that as well. And then never underestimate actual visual timing, right? You can go and do everything perfect and it still doesn't look good to a user because we had three seconds of an iPhone boot time or something like that. So just make sure you're always taking that into account. So given we have a little bit of time left before I get into the V8 stuff, I'm gonna quickly show you where these are if you haven't seen them before. So the first thing we do is we have our timeline here. What I'm going to do is boot this and we're actually going to go to that same app that we were looking at before. So within timeline, what you can do is just refresh the page once timeline is open and it actually starts recording the app as it's loading up. And we get this whole dump of information that I'm not gonna have time to go through everything one of the nice things here is we can actually start scrolling through and see what was going on in our page as it started to render and when information started to come onto the screen. So if you're actually not sure how long something was taking and you can't visually time it, this is completely accurate and a nice thing to look at. And we start to look through, if we go all the way down here, it's a little bit small on the screen and I actually can't see it because the speaker is right there but it starts to show us you know, exactly you know, how much milliseconds it took for scripting versus painting versus the actual app loading. Then if this was running slowly, we'd actually start to see red dropped all over here, which would mean that something was taking too long to animate. Just really quickly as well, if we wanted to do that CPU profile or that heap snapshot that I was talking about, we'd just switch over to this profiles tab here we tell it what we want it to do, right? Do we want it to record a JavaScript CPU profile as I refresh the page or leave it running? Or do I want it to see, take a heap snapshot and see how much memory my app's actually using right now? Waiting, waiting. I'll tell it, we're gonna, oh, there we go. So what it's showing is that this app is actually taking 20.2 megabytes of memory inside the browser right now, which might be higher than you expected or might not be. And I'm gonna show you just from slides how we actually start passing through all of this information to see what matters and what doesn't. But if you're curious, you can just start clicking through and actually seeing you know, what is the page actually rendered and where is all of the space coming from. Before I do that though, just very quickly, memory leaks are something that the heap profiler especially is going to help you discover. Um, within Chrome, there are basically two garbage collectors running on your JavaScript, um, the young generation and the old generation. So when you init everything, it starts in the young generation, right? This is you know as we create new elements or new closures. Um, and then basically everything gets garbage collected within that point and something that's been living for a very long time will be moved over to the old generation. You know, roughly 80, 85% of the code you write will never make it to the old generation. That's for incredibly long running stuff as far as the browser is concerned. So to show you what a memory leak looks like in JavaScript, if you've never seen one before, you know, what I do here is I have var node equals node, right? I just have an arbitrary div on the page. Then I create a second reference to it called node again. Then obviously I just reference the body and remove that element from the page. So at this point, we think we've done a good thing because I believe I've actually removed that from the DOM and I've saved all of this memory that I was trying to save. But actually, it's still going to exist in memory right now. It just doesn't exist in the DOM. And the reason is that we still have a reference to it. And while we have a reference to a variable, you can actually go and do this and run this in console, delete the node, type in the node's name, and it will actually still pop up. So what we do on line five is we null the reference to node 
but we still haven't cleared the memory because we have a second lingering reference. So not until you've gone through and nulled all of the references will that actually be cleared from memory. If you're using a framework like uh, Ember, I believe Angular and React would do the same cleanup for you anyway. You don't really need to worry about this. If you're sticking inside their classes, they will typically clean them up for you. But as you're starting to write custom window functions, you really should be aware of this. So that's what we just went through. And this is what a heap profile would look like if I actually had some detached nodes, is what we call them. You'll see that you know, we have our detached header at the top, and we have all of these things with red highlights in their name. That's basically the Chrome tools telling you that, hey, this thing's not in the DOM anymore, but there's a variable for it somewhere, and I can't garbage collect this thing. So that's just going to cause escalating memory usage as we go on and on. This is also why you use some apps you know, on your phone or even in Chrome, and it starts to get hotter and hotter and run slower and slower. Another really quick example here just from the blog. I'm going to skip over it just in the interest of time. But you have the same thing with jQuery listeners. If you don't actually go and null references to them and turn the listeners off, they just continue to float around ever, forever. If you're having trouble profiling, instead of just having you know, var foo equals function, actually name your functions, because then they'll show up with that name in the Chrome tools. So all of a sudden, you can start to identify what's causing problems. Just an example of doing that right there. So that's out of order. Um, we'll cover that very quickly anyway. Um, for those who are trying to do timer-based APIs, new date is also not completely accurate because we're going through some passing events. If you're trying to just output time of what's going on inside your system, window performance now will give you a completely accurate high-resolution timestamp. If you're curious about how to do the same thing in the node command line, as of node 4.4, you can actually add a prof tag. And then we do node, you know, dash dash prof, you know, foo js, and it will actually generate all the performance information about how our node script was running. Then what we can do is actually, you know, process and isolate, and I'll show you what that generates very quickly. So we get into the fun bit. So I went and ran this just as I was waiting. Then it will generate this isolate log, which has a lot of information that we don't need to be looking at right now. Whoops, that's not what I want anyway. And that second command will basically start outputting, you know, actually, what is the percentage and what was being used. So if we go all the way down, what's interesting here is that we can start to see, you know, well, how much of the time was taken from my JavaScript versus, you know, stuff that was maybe pushed to a C library inside of Node or something that would have had to have happened anyway. So sometimes we would use this at an incredibly high level. It's just to see whether it's a problem you should be fixing in your app, or whether it's a problem you should be fixing inside of a library. And obviously, the reason I'm talking about all of this is the more memory you use, the slower your app will start to run, especially on a phone. So it's not like just because there's 200 megabytes free on the machine, you should use it all. If you're interested in reading into that, this is a really good paper that starts to describe degrading performance as you use exponentially more and more memory, even if it's available. So last topic I wanted to cover, which is actually the one I find most interesting, is how V8 actually handles and passes JavaScript. So V8 actually compiles JavaScript to native code before executing it, unlike some other implementations. There are no intermediate steps in terms of converting JavaScript to bytecode. Um, compilation won't actually happen until a function is called. So it's not going to go and compile everything ahead of time. And it happens one function at a time. So we're not taking single blocks or something like that and compiling them. It takes the entire function. And this is why it's a good idea to not have one mega function that has everything that you're doing. So within V8 as well, there are generally two compilers that are running with our general compiler and our optimization compiler, which at the moment is called TurboFan. So just like um, you know, the garbage collectors, all code runs through the general compiler first. And then what happens is that V8 goes and identifies hot code, right? code that's being reused all the time for optimization. Then it runs it through the optimization compiler, or TurboFan. Um, you know, obviously, you're not always going to see up to 100x. You're usually not even going to see anywhere close to that. But you want as much code as possible to run through that optimization compiler. And again, that applies to the containing function, not blocks. So what's not optimizable is generator functions, debugger statements, eval with proto, rest params, compound usage of let const. 
and I put it in green because I'm going to come back to this, this is the bane of JS framework developers. Anything with a try, catch, or a finally will never hit the optimization compiler. Another thing that will cause a problem is if we actually leak the arguments <coughs> of a function. So here I've just returned the arguments array. Chrome's not going to know what to do here, and it's just going to stay in your general compiler. We can also reassign the arguments, right? Here I've just done argument zero equals foo. I'm going to explain why in a second, but if we pull something like this, again, we're never going to hit the optimization compiler. Then obviously, the third case here is I've done the right thing, and I've actually created a parameter called arg zero for arg zero, but then I've also just referenced it as argument zero. And again, this is creating a confusing scenario under which uh, the optimization compiler will never touch it. The reason is that in non-strict mode, V8 actually preserves the bindings between these two. So when it can't preserve those bindings, it basically gives up and throws it in. It expects them to have the same hidden class, and the last thing I'm going to touch on today is the hidden classes of V8. Interesting, though, if you use strict, it doesn't try and preserve those bindings. But just because you can do it, it doesn't mean you should. Safe usage of arguments involves using arguments n, anything with apply or length. You can call these as much as you want, even if you haven't defined the parameters and you won't have problems. So coming back to that try, catch, finally, basically what you want to do is isolate the unsafe work into a separate function where the try, catch is, and push as much work into a function that's not going to hit that try, catch as possible. And at least in this case, we're going to have maybe 80% of our code be optimized versus 0%. Last thing I'm going to touch on is the hidden classes. So in JavaScript, right, because we have numbers and strings, and unfortunately, as developers, we try and print numbers instead of strings and all types of crazy stuff, keeping track of that under the hood is really hard. So under the hood, V8 assigns almost a C class, if you want to think about it that way, to represent the object, which is called a hidden class. So to go through an example, I have a constructor function here called programmer with language and skill. And the first thing I do is I create a new programmer um, with you know the parameters ember and good. So the first hidden class is initialized. It's a completely empty programmer class you know, at that invocation called C0 or class 0. The second one is initialized when the language is assigned. So we've now created a second hidden class called C1. And the third one is assigned when we do skill. Right? So now we have a third hidden class called C2. And the right way to say is that the variable good programmer has a hidden class of C2. So basically, C0 is a hidden class that's an empty object in this example. C1 is based on C0, and C2 is based on C1. If you want to think about it, just think about it as a singly linked list where the very end node is the hidden class that we're representing. So the good thing here is if we then go and define bad programmer who's just not good at Ember, they're actually going to have the same end hidden class. And now we're starting to become a candidate for optimization. Then we have JavaScript people who go and pull stuff like this. And we add a completely new property that wasn't in our constructor function just because we could. So I, because I've been stealing graphs from everywhere, I tried to find an explainer of what Chrome's thinking at this moment, and I got it. <laughs> so the problem here is that the, that hidden class chain that we described can no longer be reused because the chain or the shape of the object is now completely different. So a new hidden class is now created for bad programmer, and now we have two different classes representing them, which means that neither are likely to be optimized. So now V8 is tracking two completely different classes under the hood. Last point on this is that assigning properties in different orders, because we were just visualizing that as a singly linked list, will actually result in different hidden classes as well. So you shouldn't really be sloppy with just defining you know, parameters on an object as they pop into your head, because they will have unintended consequences in your code. Come up with a convention and stick with it. Usually, I just stick with alphabetical, to be honest with you, because it's really hard to muck up as I'm adding extra stuff into my code. Last point I always make on this, because you know, sometimes you get people who complain that, what, I can't just add a random property to a model just because I felt like it, is that in any other language, you'd basically slapped on the wrist for doing something like this. If you consistently have this problem, it's a modeling problem, not a JavaScript problem. Last point on this is that V8 also assumes that when we're passing parameters to a function, that they're going to have the same type. Because as much as JavaScript lets you do whatever you want, it doesn't mean that the things under the hood are like that. Eventually, we're going to have to get to a low level. So monomorphic are hidden classes that are always past the same object type like you saw in that programmer constructor function that I was always passing strings. 
So V8 basically makes an assumption that classes are monomorphic, and passing a different object type to the same function requires a new hidden class to be created again. So as much as maybe we followed all the right rules, we didn't create new properties on the object, we passed things in the same order, but this time I passed a number instead of a string, again, we're not going to be a candidate for optimization. Very last point I'm going to make today, because I showed you some examples in mobile, is some mobile-specific optimization stuff. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't a really mobile-heavy talk, but it's what I find most interesting. So on mobile, you actually want your JavaScript payload to be under 500 kilobytes as possible. Under a megabyte is safe most of the time. Anything more than that, you're actually going to start seeing you know, negative ramifications of performance, especially in mobile Chrome and stuff like that. In terms of your DOM nodes, if you can stick under 5,000, you're doing pretty good. Under 10,000 in really extreme circumstances. Very rare do you even need to hit 10,000 because you should be using something like an occlusion-based scroll instead of you know, jamming everything in a list. If you're not familiar, an occlusion-based scroller is something that will actually just recycle DOM elements and inject the new data into them versus having this huge list and moving the viewport up and down. Last thing for mobile is coalesce your network requests as much as possible. Not really specific to a browser, but obviously if we're making 12 different HTTP requests, we could maybe merge some of those together. So if you're interested in just reading a little bit more into this, these are the two links that I think are most interesting for you to read. Uh, that being said, I will upload the slides with all the sources down the bottom so you can go through the other content. But that is the end of this talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>